Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, how today's bears came to be, Bear Evolution Part 2, presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Christina Disney. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Rob. And hello, everyone. Welcome back to part two. I hope you, if you tuned in last week, uh, we're going to continue the story. And if you're tuning in this week, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a catch up on, on some of the things we talked about before and then, and then uh, jump in it, jump straight into it again today. I do want to apologize. I don't have my webcam on today, but I actually wanted to talk about the reason why, because it actually has to do with NADHAB. As part of being an expedition leader with Natural Habitat, we are all um, required to do a certain amount of wilderness first aid training. And it's both necessary for our jobs, um, considering some of the regions that are quite remote that we work in. Uh, but to be honest, this is one of the joys I find about this job. This is about the third or fourth time of taking this training. We have to research on it every few years uh, and you learn so much. From it so uh ladies and gentlemen i'm actually tuning in from the from the parking lot outside of of where this is happening so apologies for that part uh scheduling got got up but i would say even if you're not a it's uh what am i trying to say here even if you're not a guide wherever you may find yourself living remote or not check into some local first aid courses or some wilderness first aid courses it's amazing skills to acquire and to have in your back pocket and to feel more confident both to help yourself and others. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's I think it's a really great thing to include in, in everybody's lives. But with that aside, let's talk about bears. So last week we talked a little bit about some of the theory of evolution and sort of the the how we talk about species and where, when and where we decide to split up uh, animals into species or, or to group them together. And then one of the things we focused on was about the process. How do we actually get species? And it's linked to something called speciation events. And I kind of like to make the joke that, you know, these events are not one night stands. These are very um, long processes often, you know, in evolutionary history, it looks like it's the snap of a fingers, but in reality, these can be over hundreds or thousands or longer of years in order to get these different species. It can also arguably get happening on, on shorter time frames, right? Um, just based on how different things become when they get separated from their previous populations. So this is the sort of four main ways that evolutionary biologists kind of look at those speciations. So there's allopatric, parapatric, parapatric, and sympatric. And those four different things, when you kind of look at the images there, you sort of get an idea for, right? Allopatric, they get separated from each other. Um, parapatric is a smaller group splits off. Peripatric, excuse me, parapatric, it's a tricky one to have them named so close together, is the idea that they're still able to, um, you know, there's no actual physical divide between them, but the micro niches of the environment start to change them to the point that they stop associating with one another. And then sympatric is something changes within a population. And even though they're all still physically capable of associating, something usually behavioral starts to change so that they, they no longer associate. And so it's through those processes over literally millions and millions of years that uh, bears, but really all species have evolved. So we talked about last time how in general, the things that we humans tend to call bears these days evolved somewhere between 60 million, excuse me, and about 38 million years ago, sort of on the, on the lower side or the more recent side. And so what this diagram is showing you is out of our eight extant bear species that we have today how they sort of broke off from one another i jokingly call them cousins in a, in a fence to, to sort of simplify and so the oldest cousin that we at the bears have is the great panda which is the uh, the earliest split so that one sort of what we know now is bears they split off around 20 to 12 million years ago then the next one is the spectacle bear that's the bear that lives in south america or the andean bear you might have heard it called and that one is somewhere around 7 million years ago it splits away and then in the last 6 or so million years ago ballpark the other remaining six species have split off with the sloth bear being the oldest the next oldest in the line, then the sun bear. And then after the sun bear, it gets a little bit, uh, little bit confusing 
because the lines are all very close together. And there's kind of that around that five million year mark is where mo where we have the American black bear, the Asian black bear, and the brown bear split off. And then the youngest of our branches is going to be the polar bear. So last time when we were talking, we talked about the giant panda, the spectacle bear, the sloth bear, and today we're going to continue the story now with the sun bear. So we're still hanging out in Asia. So the sun bear, we would break down its Latin name, Hilo Arctus Milanus, is Greek for sun and bear. If anyone didn't know that already, Arctos, or even what Arctic is named after today, is the word for bear. So uh, that's another one, another good trivia fact to keep in mind. You might need it one of some trivia night. And then Milanus refers to being located in Malaysia. And it is in Malaysia. You can also find it in southern China, uh, as far as eastern India and in Indonesia. And their name comes from that ring you can see on this bear's chest, that sort of white collar that's formed. And their coat also, if you look at this bear, is a little bit different from a lot of other bears, right? And the build is actually a little different in some ways too. They're stockier, they're quite muscular. They've got small ears, a shorter muzzle. Sometimes they get the nickname of being a dog bear. They have a, more of those canine features that we associate sort of with man's best friend. They also have a really short haired, sleek coat. It's quite coarse and thick. And they, again, they don't really have much of an undercoat to insulate themselves. And that makes sense because these are a tropical species, right? So they're more worried about protecting from UV and from twigs and branches than they are about heat conservation. They don't have to worry about trying to stay warm like some of our North American bears. Their lifespan is pretty average as far as bear goes, somewhere between 25 and 30 years. And uh, ironically, they are more nocturnal. They're not truly super active in the day. They like to lumber through the forest at night, snacking on fruits, berries, roots, small birds, lizards, rodents. They have really great sense of smell and uh, their claws are their main, main tools. They're extremely long, maybe longer than four inches which is kind of crazy to think about. And they're using those to rip open trees, termites, nests. Um, they've got that really long comical tongue that you're looking at that they can use for, for licking out honey. And to be honest, we don't know a lot about their social behavior. There is some evidence that suggests they might be uh, excuse me, monogamous. But what I wanted to point out is this amazingly cute picture here on the left is that these bears actually... Uh, have been observed carrying their cradles or cradling their cubs by walking upright and walking on their hind legs and carrying their cubs like that while they're still quite small, uh, which I think is pretty cute and, and pretty darn amazing. This bear here is a very special, specific bear to natural habitat. Um, this was an orphan bear who was named Wawa, who was found on the forest floor in Borneo, and she was at the Borneo Sun Bear Conservation Center. And what most likely happened was her mother, well, she was orphaned and either potentially through hunting or deforestation or potentially um, she was shot for the illegal pet trade. So some of the threats that sun bears really face really come down to, to those three things is you're looking at the habitat fragmentation, as with many bear species, is a is a real concern. Then the hunting, which I'll get into a little bit more probably with Asian black bears, but the the third one, which is the illegal pet trade, is partially to do because the sun bears are this are quite small bears, and so their cubs are, as you can see, quite quite cute. And so unfortunately, these are some of the issues that that these bears are facing today. When we look at how the sun bear most likely split off in time, it has to do with Asia's land connection and the, the rise and fall of seaways. And it looks like it was most likely that these tropical bears, the, the sun bear and potentially even the sloth bear, that we talked about last week, is that they got separated and they adapted to these tropical climates, right? So if you think about ice ages coming and going, and you've got the cold at the poles, and you can imagine this this curtain that falls and rises, moving north, excuse me, north and south, 
millennia over millennia. And so um, the common ancestor that we that we sort of trace them back to in Southeast Asia comes from the over, over sorry, it's French, I haven't said it out loud very much, Ursus Minimus, I'll just use the Latin name, which was about a million years ago. Uh, and that is the common ancestor that was shared by the six remaining bears. So I, what I said was, or excuse me, five remaining bears. So the giant panda splits off the first, then you have the spectacle bear, and then the sloth bear splits off. So it's still closer related to the remaining five, but the, the common ancestor to the, to the bears that we're all gonna talk about today is Ursus Minimus. All right, so that can move us on to the next cousin here, which is going to be the Asian black bear. And this is the one I think that when we often ask people to see if they can list all of the bears in the world that gets most mixed up because we most people can get seven. Sometimes they throw in a koala bear, which is not a bear, it's a marsupial. Uh, but we often forget to make the species distinction between the Asian black bear and the American black bear. And if you were here on Friday, you'll remember that we talked about what we do and don't call a species is more about how we frame it as humans, whether we're saying it is whether they're physically capable of breeding, whether they're geographically capable of breeding and having viable offspring, right? And so North American and Asian black bears have been separated for a long time. And even though it's possible for them to breed, they are they don't hybridize in nature, and so we call them different species. So that's again, right? It comes down to nomenclature and, and how we name things is often what we use to to base things on calling a species. So Ursus Tibetanus, there's about 50,000 of them. They're smaller than our North American counterparts. They're kind of maxing out around 200 kilograms. So you're looking at one and a half. So, um, you know, that sort of 350-ish pound range. Although the males can get, can get uh, you know, more comparable to some of the bears or some of the North American black bears. And they are quite in that omnivorous range we can see that uh, depending on the subpopulation where you find them right so the ones closer to japan definitely depend a lot more on vegetation than meat but they are actually um you know the same as our black bears here if you are tuning in from north america apologies if i made that assumption they are actually tend to be a bit more aggressive right so when we talk about our bears here we you know everyone makes the jokes that or makes the comments that grizzlies or brown bears are much more aggressive than black bears, but the, the Asian black bear can be quite aggressive. Um, it has been known to kill cattle, sheep, ponies. There's been uh, different human attacks as well, but in general, uh, probably relying a bit more on, on vegetation. And they are also amazing, amazing tree climbers. There's been evidence of, of black bears being able to climb trees with broken hind legs. And it's because all of their power, all of their strength is in their upper bodies. And their legs are a little bit short. They're also one of the most bipedal bears. So they're the ones, the ones that will walk the most on their hind legs and have been known to walk for more than a quarter of a mile walking upright. Again, adaptations for, for being arboreal and living those trees is they have larger pads on their front feet than they do on their back feet. And those claws are also larger on their front feet and more hooked, right? So they really are these amazing, amazing climbers. And one thing I did, this is what I wanted to bring up about sort of the hunting and the harvesting of bears. So what has been historically quite common is the hunting of, of a, mostly Asian black bears, but also some sun bears as well, and a couple other species. actually. Yeah, we'll stick with those two for now for this. So is that it's going after the gallbladder. So bear's gallbladders produces a very specific acid that has been known to dissolve gallbladder stones, but then um, in traditional Chinese medicine, it's been sort of used as a as a cure-all for lots of different things, even as far as even as far as cancer. Um, and so while I will say that Western science does support 
the work that it does for the gall, gallbladder and for liver issues, there isn't uh, any evidence that backs up the rest of it. However, so really up until the 1980s, bears would be hunted, their gallbladders have been removed, um, and they were shot. And then somewhere in the 1980s, they, they figured out a way to actually perform surgery on these bears and create essentially bear farms where they can have a tube inserted into the bear's gallbladder and harvest that bile on a regular basis, which is just really unfortunate. Um, there's somewhere estimated to be potentially 10,000 bears held in, in bear farms in China and in other places um, in Southeast Asia. And so it's again, um, this is one of the really big pressures that they're facing and and uh, a very unfortunate scenario that that hopefully will will start to shift as as it becomes more and more known and, and more and more prevalent right education is one of the one of the best ways that we can change world views so um if we look back at the past remember i said that common ancestor ursus minimus sort of seem to have branched off themselves somewhere around five six million years ago and we can tell from tooth morphology actually that it was the asian black bear is the one that's the most closely related and that's why as the asian black bear it's it's the one that we, we it's hardest to tease apart in the fossil record who is more related to who is the so between the asian black bear and the american black bear they have often been considered sister taxa right even in the name it's really comparable. So one thing we talked about a lot, uh, or actually maybe we didn't talk about too much last time, was about mitochondrial DNA versus genomic DNA. So in our cells, the mitochondria is like our little engine. It's our generator that creates energy so that we can do things. And it actually has its own DNA within it in little rings. And then there's our cell DNA that programs the whole cell and tells it what to do. And so we get our mitochondrial DNA from our mother. That's who we get that passed down from directly. And then our, our cell DNA is 50-50. That's who we inherit from both. And so you can actually track different genetics depending on which set of those DNA you focus on. And so that's what's been so confusing about part of what's made it so confusing in trying to tear uh, tease apart this fossil record between Asian black bears, American black bears, and brown bears, this 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 that five million year period is is very confusing because some of the mitochondria shows that oh you know asian black bears and american black bears are closer but then we look at the genomics of the full cell and we're like no it's actually closer to this branch and so it uh it's just kind of a, a complicated one but this is if we're if we don't nitpick too much about the details this is what we can take home is that this is the shared ancestor between who will go on to become the Asian black bear, the American black bear, and the brown bear. They were living somewhere around 5 million to 2 million years ago. And when we look at the branch that goes from Ursus minimus towards those two black bears, that branch there, um, it, it, there's also sort of another branch that might be going towards brown bear because there's a lot of hybridization that happens between them, right? Now we can look at them and see them having more distinct ranges, but they would have shared um, a lot more lifestyles and a lot more uses. So since we're in the thick of it, we're going to we're gonna switch over to the American black bear. So admittedly, before I became a polar bear guide, these were the bears that I had the, the most encounters with. I used to do a lot of remote field work uh, in Canada, so in the, in the Yukon, in northern Alberta, in Labrador, in Quebec. And, you know, uh, almost every, I wouldn't say every day at work, but every week hiking through the woods, I would run into um, one of these, one of these friends. And it really did sort of change the perspective of how humans and bears can interact because it was very different than um, than the stories you get told as a kid or you going camping and a bear comes to your campsite. It's very different because when you're out in these extremely remote wilderness places, the bear is not in your territory, you are in its territory. And I guess the sense of that is, you know, how to how to pass through and just have a 
um, have a mutual relationship that has no negative consequences. Because most of the time, as long as they don't feel threatened, they're very happy to just let you pass by. I, I can remember so many times where, you know, you're walking along and you stop and you hear something. I remember one time was really cool. I was in a recent burn and a whole bunch of fireweed had bloomed. If you don't know what fireweed is, it's this bright purpley pink flower that can grow very, very tall, like sometimes three, five, six feet tall. And uh, I was in a burn, so there's all these black spruce stems that are left in this really tall fireweed. And I could see that, and I stopped and I could see this swaying and I, this bear popped up right beside me and it looked at me, I looked at it, and it was a shock to see me as I was to see it. And it just turned and left and I, we both just went our ways. Um, and things like that happened all the time, right? So the slight anecdotal story was because uh, those types of relationships, I think, are, are sort of the goals of what we need to get back to in, in a lot of the ways that we interact with, with big predators, right? So both for their safety and, and for ours. So today, there's estimated to be around 400,000 somewhere between 400 to, to 600,000 black bear, North American black bears. Uh, their normal habitat, what's the word I'm looking for? Their known extent of habitat was all the way down into Mexico, southern U.S., all the way up into Alaska and all throughout Canada. The, the light pink is where they would have been before, and then the dark pink is where you can tend to find them today. Also, still really great climbers. They're good runners. They can run as fast as about 35 miles an hour. So that's about 50 kilometers an hour. And it's interesting, you know, when we think about their, their activity throughout the day, they are most active for so about half an hour before sunrise. Then they're going to take a nap or two during the day, and then they bed down for the night just after sunrise. And some of them will be active at night kind of to avoid people. And again, super omnivorous, right? Those food sources can anything be from insects, nuts, acorns, greens, berries. Or they can be hunters as well, going for deer, elk, things like that. When we're talking about genetics, you can't talk about uh, North American black bears and not talk about the spirit bear. It's a very, very amazing bear. There are about 100... There's between 100 and 500 fully white individuals. These are they're a subpopulation of black bear that lives here uh, in BC on the coast, and we can find them generally on on three islands in British Columbia. So that's Gribble, Princess Royal, and Roderick. And they're kind of 10 percent, 10 to 20 percent of the population. So what's happened is that it's it's a recessive gene, and so you have to have both parents have to pass on that recessive gene in order for their offspring to be white so they can have black clubs and then that gene keeps going pass forward so they're kind of like the redheads of of our bear world and so this is what i was talking about when we look at the the genetics and sort of the multi branches of of you know who's more closely related is the american black bear more closely related to the asian black bear or they're more closely related to the brown bear and it and it does get tricky because remember we're saying you have these these ice ages that are passing through these the cyclical glacial events that push populations together and apart together and apart and that happens multiple times so that what happens is that sometimes when um when all this is going on sometimes they're hybridizing with the asian black bear sometimes they're hybridizing with the brown bear um but remember i said if we look at just the mitochondrial dna and what's passed down from your mom it does look like black bears, they diverge from, from brown bears and the line that would go on to become polar bears around 3 million years ago. And that's kind of a, a relatively recent finding in our understanding of, of their evolution because up until now, I think we, we did sort of associate them stronger with the, Asian, with the Asian black bears or the Asiatic black bears. But you could almost think about the Asiatic black bear as being the closest thing we have to the earlier earliest existing relative and then these are these are the breakoff points right um and i and not that they haven't kept evolving them themselves right that's one thing about that picture that i showed you at the beginning about speciation with darwin's finches on it and it showed you these two populations but you have to remember that as, as soon as a population does split up or split off the original population doesn't stop changing itself right so the reason you know you can have 
new changes happening in both ones. And so that's another thing you have to factor into when you're, when you're tracking these stories. So with that, we will slide on over to the brown bear, or depending where you're from, you might be calling them a grizzly bear or more, more locally Kodiaks or things like that. And uh, there's just a quick story I'm, I'm going to tell to introduce the brown bear. So there was a, there was a, a national park interpreter just at a training and they were talking to a crowd of tourists. They were talking about the differences between black bears and grizzly bears. And so the, the guide was saying, you know, the best way to tell the difference between the species of whether it's a black bear or a brown bear is you should sneak up on it and kick it in the rump and turn and run and climb a tree. And if the bear climbs up the tree after you, it's a black bear. So there was an old timer in the audience uh, who thought that this test was, was much too elaborate. And he said, no, nah, all you have to do to discover if the species is a black bear, or black, black bear or a brown bear is kick it in the rump and wait a split second. And if you're still alive, then it was a black bear. And that joke, um, if you didn't find it funny, that's okay. But the joke lies in the fact that we, um, if you have much to do working with bears, you do know that, that brown bears do tend to be quite a bit more aggressive than, than black bears. Black bears are often far more often to shy away from you than, than, uh, than a brown bear or a grizzly bear will. And that has to do largely with temperament uh, and also food source and, and the way that they, it's, it's that behavior, that aggression that we see in brown bears is, is linked to the way that they've evolved. So today in the world, there's around 200,000 uh, black bears. So there's quite a few less than, than brown bears and they're spread out all throughout, uh, well, they, historically they would all been all throughout North America, but now you often find them more so on the, in the northwest but then you know they go all the way up to the arctic and then all throughout russia and uh and into into asia as well oh and then maybe i'll just clear this up right now as well so when we talk about brown bears or we talk about ursus arctus people will sometimes use the word brown bear or grizzly or kodiak and so these are all the same species there are um so grizzly is a word that we often use in North America that they don't use in Europe. And then when I was saying Kodiak, that's referring to specific populations that are along the coast um, that are associated with a, with a place, right? So they, these are all the same species. And, you know, years and years from now, thousands of years from now, or maybe millennia uh, or millions of years and eons, they might, these subspecies might become distinct from one another to a point that we would break them up into, into species of their own. But for now, they're still quite similar. And so it's mostly just about how we, uh, how we identify with them. So we're starting to get into our bigger bears, right? The males can be around six feet long, 800 pounds. Some of the ones that are, the, that are in, the North, in the Pacific Northwest are up into Alaska that are feeding on salmon that are nice and getting big and fat and round can weigh up to 1,500 pounds in that range. And I think one of the things that's so amazing about grizzly bears is that they truly are adapted, I think, to the most widest range of environments. They can live anywhere from the Arctic, the high, high Arctic, all the way down into, uh, you know, some very, very warm climates. And they play such a fascinating role in these environments because they are predators. I think we identify them as that, but they're also seed distributors. And they're also, um, you know, they eat, they go for a lot of insects and they dig a lot. That's a lot about soil turnover and soil health, right? So uh, digging up roots and grasses, and then you have the salmon and the fishing, right? Which ties, bring nutrients to the forest. They play such an amazing ecological role in so many diverse ways that, um, I think that at the end of the day is the thing I am, I am most memorized, by, mesmerized by them. When we go back into their genetic lineage and we take a look under the hood, so to speak, so we can look back at a, at a few different things. So that, uh, that beginning of our tree, right, where we have them breaking apart is tied to the breaking off of the black bears, which was done that five million years ago. Um, but one thing I haven't talked about yet, which is in brown bear DNA, are cave bears. So, so far, I've just been talking about the extant species, the species we still have today. But there are several species of bear that have, that 
developed and gone extinct. And so when, one of the ways that we, we track that is their fossil record, but we can actually see it in the genetics of the bears that we have today. So remember I said a lot of these bear species can still hybridize, right? If you were to bring those two types of black bears together, they would, they would be able to have viable offspring. So when we look at the genome of living brown bears today, we can see that from their, from their genetics, about one to two and a half percent of that comes from cave bears. And so cave bears and brown bears, they're thought to both come from that shared branch somewhere around that five, uh, five million years ago, but it looks like uh, the most common ancestors sort of live between them around that million, million and a half mark. And that was the, the most immediate precursor to, uh, to the cave bear. And so we find those mostly in Central Europe, and part of that name is maybe a bit obvious. We, we, we identify that as a cave bear because so many of their skeletons have been found in caves. Uh, it's one of the few times that we can actually find complete skeletons and, because the cave actually acts as a, as a way to preserve it. If nothing comes and disturbs that or nothing else enters the cave and it has time to, to complete your own, right? Otherwise scavengers come and when things pass away, they, they get pulled apart. So finding full full skeletons has, has happened in the past, which is pretty amazing. What's even more amazing was in August of 2020, a completely preserved cave bear from the Ice Age was found by reindeer herders in Russia. So the preserved carcass is estimated to be about 20,000 to 40,000 years old. Um, and it's the only find of its kind. It has full soft tissue, so that even the nose is still intact. So kind of like when they found you know, frozen mammoths in the past, it's a, it's a really cool, cool look into the past. Most skeletons that you'll find in museums today, uh, good science, science, science doesn't always get it right. 90% of them are classified as male, but it's mostly due to the misconception that female skeletons were just quote unquote dwarves. But um, these would have been really massive bears, right? So our, our grizzly bears, I said, were coming in at 800 pounds. That would have been a small cave bear. We're, we're looking at, um, you know, or sorry, averaging 800, but that 1,500 to 2,000 pounds, that would have been your average size or, or larger for a cave bear. So these were um, some really massive, massive creatures that existed. And I also want to talk about sort of the history of the bear, of the evolution of human history and, and bears together. So there's a really famous cave in Switzerland and between 1917 and, and 1923, an excavation uncovered more than 30,000 cave bear skeletons. So this was not, we'll use the word natural, you know, the bears did not uh, go and pass away in these caves on their own. They were collected by what seems to be Neanderthals. And there's even a, so they, uh, there's a chest. It looks like there was a limestone chest with a huge slab on it that had all of these skulls stored away within the walls and, and other locations. And they found a few of the skulls with a, a femur bone shoved through the jaw. And so it's the suggestion of sort of a, of a bear cult culture is, is kind of this idea around it. And and uh, if anyone ever did happen to catch it, I did did a whole webinar on bear stories. So if you want to go back, you can look into some of that. But um, humans and bears, that, that relationship has been there for, for a very, very long time. But let's talk about present day bears here for a second. So like I said, the, the brown bears evolved into a really wide range of, of habitat. And uh, you can find them anywhere from the plains all the way up to the Arctic. Although to be honest, we find them less in the plains today and that mostly has to do with human interaction, right? So when humans moved across North America, we, we pushed a lot of predators out of the open areas and, and into the forested areas and into the mountains. And, and probably the grizzly is the most prominent example of that. Where I grew up in Saskatchewan, we used to have the, the plains grizzly bear and that would have rivaled the polar bear for size. Um, and there's actually evidence of, of the last ones being hunted sort of in the 1930s. But it's interesting because when you look at, at current grizzly bear behavior, let's say in the Rocky Mountains, the places that they want to be, that they like to be, are the open alpine meadows. They were pushed into this other environment, which, not that there weren't some there before, but um, 
but they've all been forced into it. And so they're finding pockets of that similar environment within that more forested region. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about before I move on was um, some of, I talked about how their aggression is in their genetics. So there's a few theories, but uh, it, part of it stems from the fact that in general, this can be said that brown bears in North America are more aggressive than brown bears in Europe. There's a couple evolutional theories about that. One of them is because brown bears in North America co-evolved alongside a lot of megafauna. We had the saber-toothed tiger and we had these really big, aggressive, massive, massive predators to the point that that as grizzlies are evolving, they're actually not on the top of the pecking order. They're very much in the middle or closer to the bottom. And so they had to develop to be more aggressive to survive in this competitive world. So this is, again, this is one theory. But another really interesting theory is that uh, when we look at the genetics of North American brown bears, it's that all brown bears contain polar bear genetics, whereas not all European populations do. There's, there's a couple, but in general, it's, it shows that that mixing hasn't happened the same. And so it's an interesting overlap where we can see that something about North America's connection and throughout these different ice ages changed with that. And so that connection to the polar bear who is today our largest bear is uh, is where we're going to we're going to end with uh, with our last bear. So today in the world there are around 25,000 polar bears. That's a pretty wide range estimate. I will uh, I will tell you that uh, it's because of lots of these populations. So the subpopulation, these trends that you're looking at, this is a map that gets published by WWF every couple of years as an update. And we split up polar bear populations into nine sub 19, excuse me, subpopulations. And then we can sort of track their trends based on that. Those subpopulations are based off of primarily uh, female locations and denning sites and, and sort of looking at retention within those. And so you can, uh, from this, you can see that white areas are areas where we don't have enough information to track trends. If it's blue, it means it's stable. If it's red, it's been in decline, excuse me. And then if it's green, it's increasing. So the reason why I said 25,000 is a, is a bit of a range is because you can see that there's quite a huge amount of area where we, we don't have enough information to, to truly understand. So really, you could say that that population is anywhere coming in from the low 20,000s, maybe up to 30,000. There's actually quite a quite a swing range on it. And so these subpopulations um, have to do, you know, you could argue that it's just humans acting as splitters or groupers again, um, but it does make a difference when you think about management efforts and, and work that can be done. And so some new research that's really only just come out in the last year and a bit has been quite controversial because it's been talking about the introduction that there's actually should be a, a 20th subpopulation considered. So if you look at this map on the right side there, map B, that's showing you those the breakup of the subpopulations again, but it's zooming in on the Greenland population. So the East Greenland population, sort of all along the coast of Greenland was considered one population. There's a study that came out, however, that disputed that they should be considered a population because there's a divide between the southeast of Greenland and the northeast of Greenland bear populations. So if you look at this map here, this is tracking of these bear populations. And you can see that the bears in the south are not traveling in the same circuit as the bears north. And the fact they're, mi they're, they're barely mixing, if at all. So if we go back to how speciation starts, right? Again, we might be looking, really this might be a parapatric one, right? Where we're seeing a, an, um, a subgroup developing in isolation. And this is not so soon. I don't, um, you know, don't go shouting out on the streets that there's a new species of polar bear. There's not saying that, but we're saying that there's a subpopulation that, that it may or may not be forming. And the reason why this got a lot of news in the press uh, is because of how and why they're able to live there. So there is a lot of glaciers along there that actually support sea ice out, um, or it's 
glacier source sea ice and the bears are hunting from that. They're using it as a hunting platform. So the other bears, when the ice starts to melt, they have to retreat further north uh, to stay on the sea ice. But there's some bears that realize that they're able to hang out there longer and hunt longer and therefore are, I'm going to use the words, currently less affected by climate change. And it's that realm of thought is the reason why this got such a big, uh, big hit in the news. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I think that it's something very interesting to, to, to build into. It's not going to be this cure-all thing of being like, look, polar bears can survive climate change through relying on glacial ice. That's a very fickle creature and beast, and I, and I think that's too far to say. But it is a very, very cool discovery, uh, and it is, it's always impressive to see the, the work that's being done. So polar bears as we have them now have, in, have evolved into our, our biggest and, and baddies. Now there are some brown bears on an individual level that can weigh as much or sometimes more than polar bears getting close to that 2,000 pound mark. But in general, the size and build of these bears are the largest, right? So again, if you go back to thinking about the evolution, most of these early bear species that I've been talking about, the dawn bear from last time, Ursus minimus, these bears are quite small, and as evolution has progressed over millions and years and of years, the bears have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's because they're filling in niche roles that were previously filled by other large predators. Those predators are now gone through various ice ages. Some of it was through interactions with humans, of climate, of these huge global climate changes that have happened, right? But what happens is that it's like the clock resets, and the next thing comes to fill that role. And so when we look at the north, that image is filled by the polar bear. And since their divergence from the brown bear, around 400 or so thousand years ago, they have evolved. All of the other bears that we've talked about today are terrestrial omnivores. It means they're able to switch back and forth between um, whether they're eating meats or roots or whatever their sources is, but they're very, very flexible in their diet. Polar bears are not. Polar bears are marine hypercarnivores. They rely on mm, a few species, but primarily ring seals is their, is their main food source. They'll eat other things. They will scavenge and eat whales. They'll go for um, walruses, things like that. And if they do end up on land, they might, you know, snack on something, but that's less than 1% of their food. They might chew on some seaweed to, to kick their digestive gear in order. But, but essentially, truly, they are, they are true carnivores, which is the biggest change out of, out of the eight bears that we've talked about today, all the way to the panda, right? I remember I said the oldest cousin went full veg, uh, vegetarian. This one went full carnivore. And again... I was talking about it before, the difference between mitochondrial DNA. So a lot of work, you know, genetics, I'm not going to lie, was not my strongest suit back when I was an undergraduate student. Um, but it's a really exciting to field to be in and to follow these days because so much is changing so rapidly. You can pick up a physics textbook and that textbook hasn't changed much between really now and 100 years ago as to the principles and the basics of it. If you were to pick up a genetics textbook from 10 years ago, most of that would be considered invalid because of all the things we now learn and understand. And so it's a really, really cool field. They, uh, they fully sequenced the polar bear genome. It was either in 2011, 2012, and they've been using that, comparing it to that mitochondrial DNA I was talking about, right? So there's that picture before you. The whole cell has its own DNA, but then the mitochondria you think M for mum, we get that from our mum, and that gets passed down. So we can actually see these different mitochondrial um, groupings, or sometimes we'll call them clades, and how they split up. And so one of the things about, when we look at polar bear genetics, one of the things that we talk about a lot are the ABC islands. There are these, there are these islands where these brown bears have the most similar genetics to polar bears and so there's been a lot of talk throughout the years that this oh this must be the population where polar bears evolved from um that and so what what more work has come to pass to see is that actually this is where one of those times where the world got cold and the polar bear populations pushed down and bred with those bears. So it was actually the reintroduction of polar bear genetics into brown bears, not the other way around. So that wasn't the source of them. 
Um, and the same thing has happened in lots of places too. It's also happened in Ireland. So if we go and look over here, there have the populations of, of polar bears, oh, sorry, there's a, there are bear skulls and skeletons found in Ireland that have about 24% polar bear genetics in them. So that's been another really contentious point. Um, as well as a really famous jawbone that was found in Svalbard, where they tracked the genetics of that bone and they figured out that that polar bear that was alive around 100 and 130,000 years ago is actually a different branch of polar bears than the genetics that we have existing today. So in the same way that I said that sometimes the world of ice has pushed south and the polar bears have expanded, the world has warmed up and those populations of polar bears have retracted and different populations, think about that subpopulation map that I just showed you at the beginning, some of them didn't make it. But then when the world got cold again, the ones that did make it dispersed and spread out. And so it's only those survivors whose genetics we have hanging around with us today. And so trying to exactly map which populations of brown bear the polar bear evolved from, there isn't a clear, a clear line to it because, because of those um, advances and recessions of that and those multiple, excuse me, of the, of ice age conditions, those advances and recessions, that's what I'm talking about. But then also, the multiple times of hybridization. It makes it really, really unclear, but we do know that they did, they did evolve from their brown bear cousins. And that today, when we look at them, so I showed you 19 subpopulations, and those we break up mostly based off of management areas. But you could actually break them up and look at them, if we look at them just by genetics, we could call them three different clades. And so there's kind of like South Central Canada, and then there's also the Canadian archipelago, and then more or less all the other bears over the Arctic into Greenland, into Scandinavia and around Russia and Alaska. That's the third group. So genetically, these are three populations that are somewhat distinct from one another if we look at their, just by genetics alone. But there's, a, there's one drive home message that I, I kind of want to leave you with with the polar bear which is that if we look at all of their genetics, even though these are kind of like three, three first cousins, let's call them, between polar bears, it doesn't matter who you are. If you are a polar bear, they all share genetics from one matri uh, matriarch, from one line. They have a common ancestor. So that means in all of those different climate changes, one population of bears survived and is the reason why we have all of the polar bears we have today. So. Or I should say it could be one family, not just it wouldn't be one single individual, um, which I think is which I think is pretty amazing um, and a nice sign of of hope and resilience. So I'm going to wrap up here pretty quick. The last thing I wanted to leave you with is, um, I guess, my hope of, of what, some of what this webinar has maybe taught you or shown you. Like I said, genetics was neither my strong suit and certainly evolution looking at those terrible dry charts of the ages of rock and and what's happening can be kind of boring but the story that I've told you the last couple days between Friday and today it's the exact same story that you're looking at in this graph right so sometimes when we see something it's all about how we tell it and how we show it right but you can see you know the very beginning we have the dawn bear and the breaking up into um, the Ursus family and the spectacle bear right and so it's uh, it's important sometimes how we tell a story and how we tie it all together and that it that it still has validity today. So with that, I will pass it back to you, Rob. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So let's get to some of these questions. Um, so can you say why the black bears in northern New Mexico are more tan than brown than black? I, I'll i talk about coloration. I don't know much uh, specifically about the, one, the subpopulation in New Mexico. Um, but 
one thing about black bears and brown bears, which is a terrible thing in the name, is that just because they have the na- the color in the name does not mean they are that color. There are lots of brown bears or grizzly bears that are black or chocolatey brown or like pale, pale gold. And there are lots of black bears that range in that whole color spectrum as well. Um, really, it's the morphology of how we can tell them apart. My guess um, is that if you remember that map that I showed of black bear populations, is that this, the southern populations of black, black bears, you know, they used to be down into Mexico and all throughout California and things like that, uh, and into, uh, is that that New Mexico population, because it's separated from everywhere else, those genes have had a chance to, to become more common because it's a smaller population. And so you would just in general get more, more bears like that. It's almost like those bears are on a little island of their own. And so their genetics are sort of getting pushed in a specific direction. But again, I don't know anything about them specifically. That's just a guess. So do we have any idea what the uh, American black bear population was uh, prior to the European settlement of the continent? Oh, such a good question. I did have some numbers on this uh, in the fall because I was looking into this for a few different big predators. And I'm guessing, I'm trying to remember, so I, oh, I definitely looked this up. I think it was closer to like a million and a half. Don't quote me exactly on that, but it it was at least two or three times more. And same with grizzlies. Wolves was crazy more. Um, Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers offhand, but if you want to go back and find it, I did a webinar series on apex predators in November. And I talked about oh, how the populations have changed for a lot of these animals between pre-European contact and post. So, um, yeah, apologize, I don't have the number off the top of my head right now, but but yeah, in that range. So, it seems like the uh, the Asian black bear has the same chest stripe as the sun bear. Or is there some sort of relationship between the two? Yeah, so the so the Asian black bear, the sun bear, and as well as the sloth bear often have that distinctive chest marking. And actually a lot of our bears have, uh, a lot of North American black bears can also have a chest marking as well. Um, and it's just the, it's just the shared genetics, right? Um, I don't know what the evolutionary pressure was for it. I don't know if it's the equivalent of, you know, lions having large manes or... Uh, whether it's a, I don't think it's sexual selection or the pressure for that, but it, it's something in their genetics that has kept that and, and carried it through. And consider that it's mostly the Asian ones, I would guess that, that early ancestors was. And it's also a good thing to, you know, when people talk about like, oh, you know, why is the polar bear white? Like the ability to have those color morphs has been in their DNA the whole time, but the pressure for the selection of it wasn't there until, you know, recent in terms of evolutionary history. So are there some Southeast Asian governments working to stop these bear farms? And do you know if there's an artificial pharmaceutical replacement maybe for the bear bile in the works? Yeah, those are great questions. Yeah, lots of lots of different countries are changing their uh, stance on bear farms and, and allowing for them. Unfortunately, there's still lots of um, illegal ones that exist, I think. And then in the second answer, yes, they have created, there is a synthetic, um, it's a really long word, so I can't remember what the type of, type of acid is, but they, they have created a synthetic one, um, but the belief around traditional medicine users is that it isn't a good enough equivalent, is how I'm going to say that. Let me ask you about the sun bears. Do they do they climb trees as much as the Asiatic black bear? They do, uh, but they're not. Um, their their food source like they'll they'll split more time probably on on the ground as well, um, and their food sources. They also eat a lot more termites and insects on the ground, so that's just. Their, their food sources are more linked to the ground as well. So I don't know whether it would be a 50-50 split or something like that, but they're, yeah, they're, they're both, they're both, I guess, is what I would say. Have you heard that the uh, Asiatic black bear is also called the moon bear? 
I have heard that. I didn't bring it up here today, but yes, which, um, yeah, one of the other guys that I work with, Eddie, he, he does a lot of good stuff with, with, with moon bears. Um, yeah. And it's again, different cultural references as, as far as them being the sun bear and the moon bear. I, uh, I don't know the full story behind it, but I maybe we'll have to look that up for the next one. All right. Do we know how old the black bear species is? Yeah, so again, a bit of a gray zone, but that sort of five, six million year mark is where what we would call black bears as we know them now to to look and behave that way somewhere in there. Great, thank you. Um, so how frequent is the hybridization of grizzlies and American black bears today? Oh, very rare. Actually, I don't know. So that one is one where I think genetically they could probably still hybridize, but behaviorally they won't. Um, or it's extremely, extremely rare. Like I, I think there hasn't, I'm trying to think of the like last documented case. I'm sure there probably are some, but it, it doesn't happen super often. Um, and I think that is to do with the grizzly bear's behavior and the aggression. I think that, that black bears tend to really stay away. Well, thanks for addressing that. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'm going to throw it back to you for your closing comments. Thank you everyone today for, for joining in today. And if you join in both days, thank you for, for hanging on to the full story. It is always a pleasure to get to, to chat away about bears and deep dive into different projects or topics. So thank you so much. I hope you all in, enjoy your day and, and take care. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today, Christina. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website, nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.